happy Friday, I guess. Because I hate myself, I have decided to reread A Little Life, i.e. the saddest book in the history of the world. But also a book that I do happen to love, and it has been like three years since I last tortured myself with it, so I feel like the time is now. This video idea was voted for by my Patreons, they wanted me to do this. Basically, A Little Life reading vlogs have been all over the internet. Everyone's been doing them, basically just filming themselves sobbing. Uh, warning, if that's what you're looking for here, I'm not really a crier, I don't really cry at books, so you're probably not going to get that. But instead, this video is for those of you who have seen those other vlogs, are super intrigued, what is a little life about, but don't think you can quite take the pain of reading, how many pages is this? 720 pages of misery personally yourself and that's fine i respect that that's also how i felt before my friend forced me to read this and i happen to love it so what i'm going to do is i'm going to vlog myself reading this book and telling you literally every single thing that happens this is a full spoiler vlog so you can live the experience of reading a little life without actually having to read a little life and I'm not saying I don't recommend that you actually read it, I do. I gave this book five stars, but it's not for everyone. And if you know it's not for you, then fair, it's not for you. So over the next few days, I'm just going to read this book and tell you about it. And I can't remember, it's been long enough since I read this one that I can't remember all of the content warnings um, to give you. So I will just say there is a lot of potentially very upsetting content in this book. And so if you have particular things that you are worried about coming across, I would recommend that you Google this book, like that information is going to be out there um, before going ahead and watching this, because I will just be telling you everything that happens. I'm not going to go into graphic detail on any of these, because that's what you're avoiding here. You're watching this video maybe instead of reading the book because you don't want the graphic details, so I won't be giving you any of those, but I will just be telling you what is happening to our characters. Cool, we're ready to go. Let's go. I am not ready for this. Good morning. This is what I look like at 7.30 a.m. Let's do this. I'm not quite sure how the beginning of this is gonna go because I do remember last time I read this, the first chunk, the first like 200 pages I'm gonna say, I was just bored. I was like, this could have been an email. I still think it's kind of unnecessary uh, but maybe I will feel differently this time because now I know the characters and I know how much I'm going to fall in love with them. Okay so we've met our main cast, four boys, Jude, Willem, Malcolm and JB. You may have seen those four names on uh, that t-shirt that Anthony from Queer Eye was wearing. Anyway so they are four friends from college, they were all roommates in college. Okay more things to know about the characters. JB, uh, he is an artist and he's currently working on a series that's like dedicated to black hair. Uh, so he's literally like going around barbershops and like collecting hair trimmings and stuff and then using them in his art projects. Also, he is gay. And then Willem, we have learned about him that he is very attractive and wherever he goes, women fall in love with him, but he seems not really to notice. Oh, and we've also learned about Jude that he, like, needs the elevator to work, the elevator, the lift to work, um, because he has trouble climbing stairs. That's all we know about his, like, physical disabilities so far. These boys have all been, or these men have all been friends for, like, a decade now, and they still have absolutely no idea about Jude's past. They don't know if he ever had parents in the first place. He's just, like, this enigma to them. Okay, something we've learned about Jude is that he suffers from terrible, terrible pain in his legs. So when they met him at college, he was using a cane to walk. He also used to um, have an orthopedic crutch to help him walk. Um, but he's like very, very, doesn't like to talk about the pain. Uh, doesn't like to make a big deal of it. And Willem and him, so they were all roommates, but they had like two separate rooms I think um so Jude and Willem shared a room and it was only because of that that Willem got to see more of the pain that Jude suffers he would have these episodes that were just so so extreme but he just who would be like so apologetic about it afterwards like it's very sad um and Willem kind of learned that Jude doesn't like to talk about it doesn't like to be helped and so learned to just like remove himself from the situation and let Jude handle it on his own um because that's kind of 
what he always said he preferred but um just now he's having like another extremely painful episode and Willem goes and like makes an excuse to go and be cleaning the bathroom and then kind of is standing there realizing like I'm a coward I should be in there helping him I should like make him see that I'm here for him we haven't heard very much about Malcolm so far he is still living at home uh, and his work is at a standstill, his love life non-existent, his sexuality unresolved, and his future uncertain. <laughs> tell me about it. Okay, so I'm not going to tell you anything graphic, but we have just had the first introduction of self-harm. So it's night before New Year's Eve, the night before Jude and Willem are going to be hosting this big New Year's party, um, and in the middle of the night, Jude wakes Willem up, saying like, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, and he's wrapped his arm in a towel. Um, and he's like, I need you to take me to Andy's. And Andy's is basically, Andy is this doctor who one of the only times that the three friends managed to take Jude to the hospital back when they were at college, when he had like a very severe, um, painful episode, Andy was the doctor that they saw then. And ever since then has been like the only doctor that Jude ever will go to. So in the middle of the night, they go to Andy um, and he it did basically is revealed that Jude has been self-harming and that he had hurt himself very very badly okay so I've just finished part one and I just love these characters so much I definitely am enjoying it like right from the beginning this time around now that I know that I'm gonna love these people so much and Jude is just like such a wonderful character but I feel like I already feel like I have a lump in my throat because I like know all of the things that have happened to him but he's just such a wonderful character he's so sweet and kind and also like light-hearted and playful a lot of the time even though he's so serious and he's in so much pain and he's got so much trauma and like fear like um Willem mentioned that he has this habit of every time they enter a new room or a new space he immediately looks for the nearest exit and stands by it and Willem was like you know when we first noticed that it was funny and then it became not funny and like there's just so much terribleness I can't even remember that I'm going to discover as I go through but he's just this like I want to be his friend and I want to give him a hug okay prepare him we're going into part two okay so this is interesting part two is the first time we're actually hearing from like Jude's inner voice so far we've explored all three other characters and kind of seen their perceptions of Jude um but now we're actually like straight into Jude's head and it doesn't even use the name Jude it's just he and you just like realize you're finally in Jude's head does that make sense <laughs> we've just learned that the reason Jude has problems with his legs is because of a car injury he specifically says car injury and then people like interpret that as car accident he hears them talking about it as a car accident afterwards and is like he doesn't correct them but we know that it wasn't a car accident so we know that something like more sinister happened we've kind of jumped a little again to jude being at law school and he's talking about why he's studying law and also why he loves math so much because he's also doing a master's in pure math without the s um and i'm not gonna lie this bit's a little boring however i should mention we have met a very important character harold so harold had been mentioned a few times in passing in the bit that we read before but now we're kind of flashing back to like after he left uni he went to law school and that's where he met Harold. Um, he was Harold's research assistant um, and Harold and his wife Julia became like parental figures like often invited him around like every week for supper and Harold bought him the suits that he needed for his first job like that kind of thing. Oh, he's such a little tragedy. He just does not believe that Harold actually cares for him, even though Harold, like, so so clearly adores him and sees him kind of as a son. And, like, Harold um, has just written his fourth book, and in the acknowledgements, he writes about Jude. We don't know what he actually said, um, but Jude has to, like, keep going and finding the book and looking at it again to kind of believe that Harold actually cares for him. And even then, he's still in his head going, like, it will end this month next month he won't want to talk to me next month like he's trying to prepare himself <sighs> angel okay so when i said that i never cry at books i think i kind of forgot that last time i read this i wasn't in the middle of coming off antidepressants nothing even major just happened just the relationship between jude and harold is really really special and harold had a son who died um and there was just a scene where jude obviously is like suffering from ptsd we still don't know the details of what happened to him but he when people make like sudden moves towards him it really scares him and Harold had made a move towards him in like just a kind of jokey way they were like messing around 
and Jude had jumped back and knocked off this ceramic mug that Harold's son Jacob had made right before he died and it smashes and Jude is like absolutely horrified that, he done, that he's done this um, and Harold's like completely gentle, completely fine about it and then Harold writes him this letter and it was just like this line where he talks about the, it as a metaphor for life Things get broken and sometimes they get repaired and in most cases you realise that no matter what gets damaged life rearranges itself to compensate for your loss, sometimes wonderfully. Oh, life rearranged itself so they could find each other. Okay, for the first time we are going back to find out some concrete truths about Jude's past. So he was found abandoned as a baby near a monastery and the monks took him in. Are they monks? monks live in a monastery right yeah <laughs> called, they're called brother something and they live in a monastery um they took him in and he grew up there but we know that he was hit by the brothers um and emotionally abused by them kind of the way that they talked to him about why he was abandoned oh god okay so the abuse gets a lot worse at the monastery he has his hand burnt as a punishment for something the beatings get really constant and also it's insinuated that the brothers or the monks start sexually abusing him as well i think one of the saddest things about jude as a character is that he is this optimistic or well, optimistic is not the right word but he is this hopeful person he has this kind of voice in his head that's asking him who he thinks he is to inconvenience so many people to think he has the right to keep going when even his own body tells him he should stop so it's almost like you know they're worried about him being suicidal but it's almost like he's the opposite if that doesn't that doesn't make any sense but that he feels like he's not supposed to have the right to want to keep living but that he does want to. Let's just quickly talk about the way the book is written because it's interesting and unusual and I don't think I noticed it that much the first time around or at least I don't remember. Part one as I said at the time was just told in like regular third person narrator and it kind of jumped between telling you about Malcolm, JB and Willem and we hear about Jude only through those three's perspective of him. And that was the whole of part one, I think. Then part two started, and that's the first time that we actually get to hear about Jude's thoughts and go inside his head. It's still told in third person, but I don't believe it ever, ever, ever says the name Jude. Like, the name Jude shows up in dialogue when people are talking to him, but I might have to go back and check if it's true, but I'm pretty certain the narrator never, never says Jude. I don't know why. I don't know exactly what that means he's just he but we know that the he is Jude um so that was the first chapter of part two it was a pretty big chapter that was all about Jude and now I'm into chapter two of part two and suddenly like very unusual to switch at this stage we're like 150 pages in for the first time we have a first person narrator and also it's told from I to you. And I think that the I is Harold, the father figure, and you is Willem, the best friend. And this is Harold kind of talking about his relationship with Jude and why it was so special, but also we're now going back a little bit into his own past and learning about his growing up. Total, like, out of left field, complete change there. And it's interesting. What does it all mean? What is it all for? How do I analyze it? I don't know, it's been so long since I went to school. Harold asked to adopt Jude legally, and it's so beautiful and Jude's so happy. Oh, what a world. Oh my goodness. And the adoption means so much to Jude because after living at the monastery, when he was about 12, 13, he was moved to a home. And from there, they try and get the children adopted. They have this literally like fair where they would go and Couples would come and like look at them and look through binders of them and stuff and he was chosen for a trial weekend by this family who like straight away wants to change his name and they wanted him to work for them in the farm and stuff and it like meant so much to him. He was so convinced he was going to be chosen and he was going to be able to be someone new, be this new person. But then after the trial weekend they just never called, they just changed their minds and they never wanted him and he could never get over wondering like what he had done wrong, was there something he could have done better. So now even as an adult, we're like in the weeks leading up to the legal adoption, 
by Harold and Julia and he's like stop taking their calls stop talking to them because he so badly wants it to go through and he's so worried about what he might do wrong some very graphic descriptions of self-harm skim reading that bit he's so sorry he feels like he has to be sorry for these things that have happened to him so we haven't had the full story yet there's more to come I remember um but he's been you know he was sexually abused at the monastery that kept happening at the home as well he now has STDs that he's living with and he feels like he has to be sorry to all the people around him okay finished part two I'm taking a break pausing on a nice happy part of the story that is something that's worth knowing about this book is there is a lot of happiness and that is something that no one told me <laughs> like everyone who told me about that book before I read it was like it's just unrelenting sadness and awfulness and I just didn't find that to be true there is a lot of sadness in the book don't get me wrong it is one of the saddest books that I've ever read filled with like the greatest amount of suffering but it's not just unrelenting sadness there is love in there there are these amazing relationships so yeah that's just something to know there is a lot of good in the book as well so I'm pausing right now on a good bit <laughs> I will return for part three when I've strengthened up a bit Hello, it is later. I'm going to read part three now. First observation is that we are back to now hearing Jude's name mentioned by the narrator and I just went back and checked and throughout the whole of part two no one was using Jude's name so even in the section where it was like from Harold's perspective also was just calling him he. So I feel like it's something about this connection between Harold and Jude that like goes to their actual like core connecting. It goes beyond the Jude that was created by his trauma. So the name Jude was given to him by the monks. Um, and he even talked at some point about how he always hated that name. Jude was like the patron saint of the, the <laughs> Jude is like the patron saint of lost causes or something, or of like the hopeless and helpless. Um, so it's like this beautiful connection between Harold and Jude and also this way that Jude sometimes is able to see himself as at this stage in his life he's able to see himself as more than the Jude that was created by his history. Did I just write an essay? Anyway we're into part three now his name is being mentioned and the other three are back being like major characters again. Everyone's worried about JB we're not sure exactly why yet we just think he's not okay malcolm is getting married willem is having a fair amount of success as an actor uh, and just like loves jude so much precious cinnamon roll um and jude is in a lot of pain he's in a wheelchair now and he remembers the days when he used to like go for walks so that's something that i don't think i ever mentioned but he really loved going for walks even though his legs like weren't really up to it his doctor would get mad at him and now he like thinks back on that and he's like lol i can't believe i used to be able to walk around so that's sad well okay so that part was all about their friendships and just showing like jude being such a good friend <laughs> to all of them so jb is the one who's like the most troubled at this point in their lives he's become addicted to drugs and he's feeling really abandoned and alone he's just not in a good place anyway so we kind of follow that descent but we checked in with all four characters and saw the ways that their friendships are so important and they're so there for each other but Jude still is so completely unable to see that they might want to help him he so entirely thinks that he is a burden and must do everything in his power to not be more of a burden to them and is like unable to see that everything all four of them do for each other is from love. It's so sad, I just want him to see it. Before I crack into part four, I forgot to mention like the last thing that happened at the end of part three, which was really sad. So JB, as I said, is like not in a good place at all. And Jude has been trying to help him. Like he called up Jude and was like, please like get rid of all the drugs in my apartment, like please help me. But then he, while Jude was in his apartment doing that, he went out and like bumped into the guy who basically is like a bad influence on him and he ends up like running away from Jude and going off with this other guy um and the other guy was like making fun of Jude and the way he walks was doing like this horrible like parody caricature impression of him and anyway then a little bit later like right at the end of this part 
all of the friends confront JB and they're like, we're here for you, like we want to help you and he's trying to resist it and then he starts doing the impression of Jude um, and everyone like, and then Willem like punches him and then next thing you know he wakes up and he's in hospital and Jude is there, like none of the others are there but Jude is there like curled up asleep who's obviously just been by his side all night so it finishes with JB like just lying there being like crying being like I'm so sorry Jude forgive me I can't believe I did that but like silently Jude's asleep JB's in internal turmoil okay with that we're now starting part four. Oh, this is sad okay so it's been three years since that night that JB did the impression of Jude um and after like seeing him through his recovery Jude then just hasn't really been able to bear being around him ever since Willem completely come off Jude just like can't get the image of him doing that impression out of his head and he feels like people have hurt him like so many people have hurt him in his life but this was the first time someone hurt him like that who he thought loved him who he knew loved him because JB clearly does love all of them so much and you can see that in like the he does these amazing painting series that are all about the friends um and it's the first time that someone who loved him and who he didn't know saw him that way could hurt him like that so it's been three years and he's just been unable to forgive him partly because he's scared he's going to do the impression again and just at the end of this part here he like stands in front of the mirror having just seen JB they were all at a wedding together um coming back and self-harmed and then stands in front of the mirror and thinks JB was right that's why he can't forgive him is because he was right to see him that way and then he starts doing that impression of himself himself oh god it's about to get really bad so after feeling lonely he meets a man called Caleb at the dinner party who invites him out on a date he doesn't realize it's a date when he goes he thinks he's looking for a lawyer um but then at the end of the night Caleb kisses him and invites himself up so he's like three months into this relationship now with this horrible man called Caleb who hates his walk uh, like he hates his limp and kind of infers that he wouldn't have asked him out if he realized he had a limp um but really really hates his wheelchair and it's like when Jude says sometimes I need it sometimes I don't Caleb's like yeah be sure that you don't I hate him I hate him I hate him I hate him poor boy okay we're taking a break from that that last chapter was truly awful Caleb begins hitting him Caleb has this like complete repulsion of any signs of weakness and he views Jude's health issues and his disabilities as weakness um so he starts hitting him and then one night he Jude um, wakes up like unable to move his feet and he needs extra help and Caleb won't let him use the wheelchair and he gets so angry watching Jude fall over that he beats him up, he rapes him, he then leaves. Jude thinks, okay, I'm, I'm safe, it's over, I, I'm out of that. Um, but then one night he's at a restaurant with Harold and Caleb appears, completely drunk, um, starts insulting him. Harold gets really mad, which makes Caleb worse. Um, but they, they kick him out of the restaurant, it's fine, and then Jude goes home, opens the door, and Caleb is in there, and he completely beats him up, um, and it's absolutely horrific, and, like, Jude has this particular sadness of, like, the fact that this is happening to him in his apartment that was, like, Malcolm, his friend Malcolm had, um, done all of the interior work on it, so it was, like, in his safe apartment that was, like, gifted to him by people that he loves, this is happening, and then the chapter ends with Caleb, um, pushing him down the stairs. Whew, okay, that's what happened. Okay, so the last chapter of that part was maybe the worst so far. Um, so that was another one from Jude's perspective and we're alternating between present day and the past. Um, so in the past we go back to when he is just 10, no, I think nine at the time. It's kind of the years from when he's nine to 11. And um, one of the brothers at the monastery, Brother Luke, was the only one who was ever kind to him and never hit him, never never abused him, um, just would like, he would teach him things and they would spend time in the garden together, gardening, and he grew to really, really love Brother Luke. And Brother Luke started telling him, we're gonna run away together. Um, we're gonna go and live in a cabin in the woods, just the two of us. <laughs> So it builds up to this moment when he does run away with Brother Luke and they're driving off to this cabin that he's been told they're going to live in um, but they have to stop at a motel for a while and at first things are fine. Luke teaches him like piano and languages and all this stuff and they go, he takes him running and he keeps telling him I'm working on getting us the money to go and live in this cabin. Um, but after a while he says, I don't have enough money, I'm going to need you to help me make some money. And then he starts um, 
basically he's he becomes his pimp basically and this boy is like nine years old at the point this starts he's already been sexually abused by the brothers at the monastery and he's now become a sex worker and this goes on for years and he eventually realizes there is no cabin in the woods that's not happening it's never going to happen and then to make it worse <laughs> brother luke himself also starts having sex with him and telling him that he views brother luke as a father he thinks they're going to be father and son um but luke slowly switches the way that he you know says he would say we love each other i love you and he slowly makes that into we we're in love with each other um the things that we do together it won't hurt the same way it won't be as awful as it is with the clients because it's different because we're in love um so he's like grooming him and luke also teaches him how to self-harm that's where that comes from um and this goes on for a few years until uh the police arrive one day um to arrest brother luke and brother luke takes his own life before they can get him um and the reaction you know jude is kind of rescued and he's taken to a doctor but everyone's reactions to hearing what happened for the last few years are so horrified that jude interprets it as that he's dirty he's shameful um and then he's taken to the home where as we found out earlier the sexual abuse just keeps happening from new people there um so we're going between that awfulness in the past and then also flash forwards to present day where jude decides to take his own life and he attempts to do that um it, he doesn't but he's very very seriously injured and he spends some time in a psychiatric ward after that but um <laughs> it's just like the absolute saddest thing when he's deciding that he doesn't want to live anymore is he has this image in his head of this cabin in the woods where he he thinks that if he stops living he'll be able to reach the cabin in the woods and then for the first time in his life he'll be able to rest somewhere safe but after the suicide attempt after he comes home from the psychiatric ward willem moves back in with him again willem is now a pretty famous actor um but he pulls out of a project and comes back to live with jude and he says he asks him this is what i need from you i need you to tell me what has happened to you and jude um gets this flash of thinking about anna his social worker back from when he was a teenager and um is like craving seeing her because at the time she had said please let me teach you how to talk about this stuff it's just going to get harder and he never could and now it's so much more impossible he's kind of craving please anna ask me just one more time ask me if you can help because i'll say yes i need you to help me now <laughs> okay i'm gonna stop making Part five is called The Happy Years. Do we believe this? So here's what's going to begin those happy years. Willem, who, as we know, has loved Jude for decades at this point, is realising that perhaps the love he feels is not just friendship. He loves him. He wants to kiss him. He wants to marry him. Okay, they're going out and it's going really well. And Jude is learning to really enjoy, like, the physical closeness, like... They're not, he's taking it very slow. He's not sure that sex is anything he'll ever be able to um, enjoy, but just like, they cuddle. <laughs> it's just really nice. Um, and Caleb just died. The obituary was in the newspaper that Caleb died. And fuck that asshole. Their relationship's really lovely. We're in the happy years, as it promised. And also their relationship is very two-sided, which is nice. Like, obviously, Jude is the one who has all of this trauma. Willem takes care of him but also in so many other ways Jude take care, takes care of Willem like it's it is an equal relationship it's just nice I know things are gonna go bad but for now I'm just enjoying it being nice cool well that happy bit didn't last very long did it we're now a couple of years into their relationship they have started having sex which has been very uh hard for Jude and brought all of his worst self-harming back to the surface Willem has been really struggling with it. There was even a bit where Willem caught himself harming in the night after having like begged him not to, begged him to wake him up and ask for help when he felt that urge. And then Willem actually cuts himself in front of Jude kind of to show him how horrible it is to watch someone that you love hurting themselves that way. Um, but, you know, that didn't help. It just led to this more guilt and shame for Jude. Um, and where I've just got to, Willem has been away for a while working on a film uh, and Jude, like, very, very badly burnt himself because he promised not to cut himself, so he very badly burns himself instead. 
it's all terrible. Okay, Jude and Willem have this huge, huge fight. It nearly ends with them breaking up, um, but then Willem, like, rushes back, and they basically, like, lock themselves in the cupboard, and Jude finally tells his whole story to Willem, and he admits to Willem how much he can't bear having sex, and Willem kind of realises that he's, like, almost behaved like the people in Jude's past. It's intense. It's very intense. Okay, one last bad flashback, and then we are done with the trauma from Jude's past. So after his time spent with Brother Luke, then he was taken to the home uh, where he continued to be abused. And then from there, in the most recent flashback, we learned that he ran away from the home one night. Uh, hitchhiked to Boston or like towards Boston again through um, you know repaying men who would pick him up with sex so that just continued to be the only way that he knew how to survive and then he gets ill he contracts some venereal disease and he's getting weaker and weaker and passes out outside a gas station and when he wakes up he's in the back of a car and basically this psychiatrist calls himself a psychiatrist called Dr. Trailer picks him up takes him to his house and basically like keeps him imprisoned there for about four months um curing him like he gives him pills he gets him through the infection um but then begins raping him and keeps him prisoner there for these four months doing worse and worse things to him until finally he decides i i don't want you anymore it's time for you to go and he takes him out in the car and says run and he basically for ages has Jude running along the road while he's driving in the car right behind him, like bumping into the back of his legs. And Jude has always loved running. I don't know if I've mentioned that before. He used to run cross country. It was like one of the only things that he liked doing with Brother Luke. Um, and he keeps running and running, but it's getting harder and harder and harder. And eventually he falls and he can't get up anymore. And then Dr. Trailer just runs over him. And that is why his legs are so damaged. And here is quite a good example of like the hopefulness that I always say I like about this book even though people are like how do you find hopefulness in it but it basically is talking about how after the final experience with Dr. Trailer his life became more improbable by the year and so as the years went by he broke his promises to himself again and again he did end up following people who are kind to him he did trust people again he did have sex again he did hope to be saved and he was right to do so not every time of course but most of the time he ignored what the past had taught him and more often than he should have been, he was rewarded for it. It's nice. There's niceness. If only we could believe it was now going to be a happy ever after for Jude. But we cannot believe that. Okay, Jude and Willem have settled into this wonderful relationship. They're no longer having a sexual relationship, but they are a couple and have this incredibly loving relationship. It's so beautiful. But... Jude is getting very, very ill. So he's been having a couple of like very serious bone infections in his legs and basically Andy says that he needs to have them both amputated. So that's been a really sad part of the story, him coming to terms with that and also his trauma just kind of chasing him and getting worse and worse. He's having these nightmares at night um, and he's just very unwell but very happy with Willem. The amputation turns out to be this pretty great thing because after the recovery period, suddenly June's not in so much pain all the time and he has the energy back to do these things that he used to love doing. So he can go to plays, he can even walk for like hours at a time. It turns out to be this great thing in his life. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Willem died. He was in a car accident. It's not fair. Oh, it is grim. So Malcolm also died in that car accident, we discover, with Willem. Uh, so uh, Jude and JB are left and falling apart, and Jude just spends his days rereading old emails and looking at old photos, and he gives himself like a quota of how many he's allowed to look at because he has to save them. Ah, it's rotten. Oh, it's okay, Hippo. <laughs> I'm okay. <laughs> she always comes to comfort me. <sighs> so it's finished. So after Willem dies, Jude hangs on for about three more years until, of course, he kills himself, as they all knew that he would. And that whole section was narrated from Harold's perspective, and it's just <laughs> absolutely heartbreaking. And he leaves behind um, for Harold this letter where he like, confesses his past and um like Harold can't bear the fact that he 
died thinking that he owed them an apology for what had been done to him. Like, he never, ever, throughout all the people who loved him, was able to believe any of it other than the terrible things that had been done to him and said to him and how he was made to believe, the things he was made to believe about himself in those first, like, 15 years of his life. It was very bleak. I can't remember now why I've always said that I found this to be a beautiful, hopeful story because what is the hope in that? Yeah, it's depressing, right, Hips? In conclusion, I did love A Little Life every bit as much the second time around, if not more. It really, really isn't for everyone. It is so horrific, as you've just seen everything that happens. Um, and, you know, some of those scenes are pretty graphic. I really had to, like, half shut my eyes at some of those. It's a terrible, terrible story about trauma and about how hard it is to see yourself as anything other than the worst things that have been said to you. But I think the reason I find it this beautiful story is that there is so much love in it, even though that love causes so much heartbreak. You know, Jude loves Willem so much and then is so destroyed by his death. Harold loves Jude so much and is so heartbroken. Like all of these things, we're just reading like the worst case scenarios. We're reading so much tragedy, so much suffering. But even within that, the biggest theme in that book, the biggest recurring emotion is love. And also I guess how Jude, this person who thinks so little of himself the whole way through the book, while he doesn't know it, he is able to bring so much joy to other people's lives. He's such a good person, he's such a kind person. Uh, and there are so many people, Harold and Willem and JB and Malcolm and Andy and the people that he works with and Richard, I don't think I've ever mentioned him, who lives in his building and is, becomes a really good friend. There are so many people who love him so much and that that love is, you know, it's a two-way street. It's because of the amazing things that he brings to their life. I feel blue. But there you go. If you've ever wondered <laughs> what a little life is about, that is what it's about. I'll buy it though. She didn't feel like comforting me for too long. I obviously got boring. I'm gonna go and cry myself to sleep now. Uh, but I will see you for a cheerier video, hopefully, next Friday. I can only apologise about all the misery I just put you through, really.